Who are some of the scammers who completely deserve the consequences of their actions? Let's get right into it with... Number six, sister scammers. Three sisters, Lindsay Burden, Emmeline Burden, and Sarah Burden, ran an all-female fraud gang that used stolen receipts and credit card numbers to steal tens of thousands of pounds of designer clothes, beauty treatments, and cash. The sisters would steal cash register receipts and use the card details to make fraudulent purchases. They would claim their cards were damaged and, shortly after the purchases, would return the items for cash. The trio manipulated sales assistants into issuing refunds to their accounts using ATMs and stores. The sisters would frequently book hotel rooms and then contact the front desk to say they had a family emergency and had to cancel. They would present a different card number for the refund. Sometimes they would pick up a card device and enter a PIN default to refund themselves for whatever they wanted. The Burden sisters didn't always use the cards for refund. They also bought various items like designer clothing, power tools, high-performance car parts, motorcycles, and motorcycle accessories. However, the three women had to change their approach when the pandemic hit and the country went into lockdown. They shifted their focus to off-license alcohol stores and gas stations where they would use stolen card details to purchase hundreds of dollars worth of alcohol, lottery tickets, and cigarettes. In May 2020, the police raided several homes across Greater Manchester, where they lived, and eventually arrested the sisters. During the raids, police seized motorcycle clothing, a motor vehicle, furniture, electric scooters, and large amounts of cash. Businesses suffered significant losses due to the burdened sisters' actions, totaling almost $75,000. Employees who the women unknowingly trapped in the scheme also suffered the consequences. One victim, Phil Sargent, almost lost his job. He worked for Millennium Motorcycles, a place that the women frequented often. Sargent's boss suspended him for the cash losses, and he suffered from severe depression as a result. After a disciplinary hearing, his manager told him he could keep his job, but was placed on probation. Lindsay Burden's lawyer, Christopher Hunt, claimed his client experienced many issues in her life, which led to low self-worth. He stated she committed her crimes out of desperation, and it was inevitable police would catch her at some point. Emmeline Burden's lawyer also defended his client, saying she wasn't living a luxurious lifestyle and was sending some money to other individuals. The Burden sisters pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit fraud and received a total prison sentence four and a half years. Sarah was jailed for 18 weeks, Lindsay was jailed for two years and two months, and Emmeline was jailed for 22 months. Each one now has to bear their own burden. Number five, accidental exploitation. In August 2020, a Volkswagen Polo carrying four young men crashed into a house and burst into flames. No one made it inside the car. The car traveled up to 120 miles per hour and the driver's blood alcohol levels exceeded the legal limit. Passersby desperately tried to save the young men. A truck driver and a taxi driver described hearing screaming and shouting coming from the car or unable to rescue the young men because of the force of the flames they produced. Shortly after the accident, Jason McDonald created the fake GoFundMe page where he elicited donations under the guise of using them to create a permanent memorial in remembrance of the four victims. But he never intended on using the money for anything but himself. His accomplice, Kyle Saunders, helped him set up the page, hoping to get a cut of the profit. They raised money quickly, with people thinking their donations were for the victim's memorial. The page raised roughly $7,800, but their access to the money didn't last long. Detectives received a tip off about the fraudulent page. Police investigated the case and found evidence linking McDonald and Saunders to the crime. During a search, police also found McDonald in possession of illegal substances with the intent to sell them. McDonald was charged with possessing criminal property in the form of the money raised on the GoFundMe page and possession. Saunders was charged with fraud by false representation. Families of the victims set up a genuine fundraising page, which raised roughly $11,000. They used the money to create a garden of reflection at a nearby park. Number four, Dr. Fraud vanishes. Two gangs ran an elaborate operation to scam insurance companies over bogus car accident claims. They allegedly bribed police dispatchers and healthcare workers to obtain information about New York and New Jersey car accident victims. The gangs would then connect with crooked doctors who performed unnecessary medical procedures on the victims. Then the gangs overbilled insurance companies by exploiting automobile laws requiring companies to pay for the victims' medical bills. First criminal enterprise was led by Alexander 
little Alec Gulkara, who stole over $30 million by paying medical organizations to use their legal licenses as part of the scheme. He enlisted the help of Albert Aronoff, an NYPD officer who supposedly performed extensive searches through department computers to obtain information about accident victims. Meanwhile, a gang of runners allegedly bribed public servants to acquire confidential information, which they then used to guide patients to the doctors affiliated with the gang. Doctors Rolando Chuma Chumachero and Marcelo Quiroga also played a significant role in the scam. They would prescribe unnecessary and extensive medical treatments to accident victims. The doctors would then overbill insurance companies under the no-fault laws, which required insurance companies to cover medical bills related to car accidents. Golkarav and his co-conspirators Roman Israelov, Peter Kamov, and Anthony DiPietro could face over three decades behind bars. Dr. Chumachero and Dr. Kiroga faced up to 10 years in jail, and Albert Aronov could face up to five years in prison. A second group, led by Bradley Pierre, ran a similar, more profitable operation. The group fraudulently owned and operated five healthcare companies through bribes and kickbacks. Over 13 years, they made over $70 million in profits. Pierre enlisted the help of Dr. Marvin Moy and Dr. William Wiener. Dr. Moy reportedly conducted unnecessary and sometimes painful electrodiagnostic testing on patients, while Dr. Wiener falsified clinical injury findings and MRIs to increase patient referrals. No-fault accident schemes like this can cost insurance companies millions of dollars and have become increasingly popular. The schemes involve providing phony or unnecessary medical services to accident victims, leading to increased costs for consumers, private insurance, or government-subsidized programs designed to help those in need. The story took a strange turn when Dr. Moy was involved in a completely not suspicious boating accident off the coast of Long Island. Allegedly, Moy's boat collided with a larger vessel about 25 miles off the coast of Fire Island, throwing Moy overboard. Coast Guard reported that Moy's boat sank and they found debris and oil sheen in the water. However, Moy's friends found the whole situation unusual. Moy loved to boat, but it didn't make sense for him to be so far out to sea after midnight during the week. The Coast Guard conducted boat and helicopter searches for 30 hours over almost 5,000 nautical miles. The next day, they called off the search. There was a passenger with Moy that night who was found shortly after the accident, but Dr. Moy has yet to be recovered. Sounds like something fishy happened. Number three, Riley's Warrior. Lindsay Abool created a GoFundMe campaign called Riley's Warriors, where she claimed her 11-year-old daughter, Riley, was suffering from a terminal central nervous system disease and that her brain was shutting down. Abool and Riley appeared on a local news station where Abool spoke about her daughter giving up her dream of playing softball as her doctors were too worried that the sport's physical demands would be too tough on the girl. Malone University softball team was touched when they learned about Riley's story. They invited her to throw the first pitch in a scrimmage against Walsh University and shared the GoFundMe campaign with their fan base. The only problem was that Riley's illness was fake, and her mother scammed five grand in GoFundMe donations. In May 2021, someone tipped off the Stark County Department of Job and Family Services to say that Abul was scamming people and lying about her daughter's illness. When authorities investigated the case, they discovered that a medical professional found no evidence to back up Abul's claim, even though Abul and Riley attended three years of therapy to learn how to cope with their death. Abul pleaded guilty to charge charges of child endangerment and theft. Her lawyer claimed it was the best choice for Riley as it avoided further traumatizing her after being put through so much. Abul was sentenced to four to six years in prison and ordered to pay $8,500 in restitution. Riley, thankfully, now lives with her father. Number two, NYPD union boss busted. Edward Mullins was once the respected leader of the Sergeant's Benevolent Association, also known as the SBA, one of the largest and most combative police unions in New York City. That was until news broke he had been stealing from the organization for decades. Mullins allegedly fraudulently reimbursed himself for nearly $1 million of personal expenses he charged to his credit card over his almost 20 years as a union president. Some of these expenses included luxury items, expensive meals, college tuition. Mullins would file tweaked expense reports with the union treasurer but rarely provided receipts. The treasurer still gave him reimbursement check which he would deposit into his account and use to pay his credit card bills. Mullins also altered his credit card statements to make it
make it appear that items cost more than they did. The money went toward everything from a relative's college tuition to expensive jewelry, clothing, home appliances, and meals. In 2019, he sought a $3,000 reimbursement from meals at a Greenwich Village restaurant, despite the meals being unrelated to his union work. Mullins was one of the most combative leaders in the history of the New York City Sergeants Union. He was known for his bombastic and sometimes vulgar statements and gained national attention when he came forward as a loyal supporter of former President Donald Trump. He was also a strong opponent of police reform and a fierce defender of past and present sergeants. His aggressive attitude often caused controversy. Tensions between Mullins and former Mayor Bill de Blasio escalated in 2020 when Mullins shared a police report on Twitter that detailed the arrest of de Blasio's daughter, Chiara. The arrest was over her participation in protests over police brutality and racial injustice. Mullins' Twitter usage has also got him in trouble. He used a vulgar name to refer to the city's health commissioner at the time, Dr. Oxyris Barbo, and disparaged Representative Richie Torres, city council member. In 2021, Mullins received a fine of roughly $32,000 for violating police department's social media rules for his online behavior. Later that year, in October 2021, federal investigators raided his home and the union headquarters. A month later, Mullins retired from the police department. Mullins served as president of the SBA from 2002 until October 2021 and operated his scheme throughout his entire time in the position. On February 22nd, 2022, Mullins surrendered to the FBI in Manhattan, where he was charged with one count of wire fraud. If convicted, Mullins faces up to 20 years in prison. Looks like Mullins wasn't as untouchable as he thought. Before we get to number one, if you love these stories about how these scammers got what they deserved, definitely stay tuned on this video to watch our previous release about scammers who got caught red-handed scamming their friends and family. Number one, pancreatic nothing. Madison Russo took to TikTok and GoFundMe to talk about her battles with stage 2 pancreatic cancer, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and a tumor the size of a football that had wrapped around her spine. She documented her cancer battle on social media, sharing videos and posts of herself undergoing chemotherapy and radiation treatment. Russo claimed the treatments were making her very ill and spoke about the financial burden of medical bills, gas, meals, and expenses, which she didn't want to worry her family about. Her GoFundMe description urged people to donate to help cover her expenses so she could focus on beating cancer. Problem was that there was no cancer to beat. Russo gave talks about her health struggles at St. Ambrose University, where she was a student. There are reports she also spoke at the National Pancreatic Foundation. However, the National Pancreatic Foundation has denied she ever spoke at any of their events. She also appeared on the Project Purple podcast, a nonprofit organization aimed at raising awareness and funds for pancreatic cancer research, supporting patients and their families, and promoting early detection. Russo spoke of her struggles with pancreatic cancer and leukemia. When the truth about Russo's conditions came out, a spokesperson at the organization stated that they had no reason to think she wasn't telling the truth. Medical professionals were puzzled by Russo's posts on social media. They noticed many discrepancies in her videos as her medical equipment and placement didn't seem appropriate for her supposed treatment. Eventually, anonymous witnesses contacted authorities. Investigators learned she had never been diagnosed with any tumor or form of cancer at the medical facilities in the area. Russo allegedly stole photos that actual cancer patients shared online and presented them as her own. She told many lies in interviews, including alleging that doctors told her she had an 11% survival rate and had undergone dozens of rounds of chemotherapy. Russo was arrested and charged with first-degree theft after scamming over 439 donors out of $37,000. She was released on a $10,000 bond and is due back in court on March 2nd, 2023. She faces up to 10 years in prison if she's found guilty. What's worse, scamming your own mom just to buy a new car to flex on social media, or running a Ponzi scheme and scamming money from all the people around you? Let's start with number five, mom's new car. In 2018, Heidi Carruthers bought a shiny new BMW for 42,000 pounds with her mom's help. The problem here is that the role of her mom was played by someone else. The misrepresented mom didn't find out about anything until she was later contacted about the car payments falling behind. Carruthers is a serial offender. Her rap sheet has a whopping 79 previous offenses, 34 of which ended in convictions. The 35-year-old wasn't expected to see much mercy from the court when it all came to light. When the case was addressed in court earlier in 2022, 
All signs pointed toward Carruthers having the book thrown at her. Then her attorney, Steve Hennessy, brought forth a relevant fact. Carruthers had given birth to a daughter in 2019 and had since turned things around. Carruthers had reportedly shown remorse and embarrassment over the whole thing and supposedly had committed no other offenses since the birth of her daughter. She was also a prior user who had been clean since the pregnancy. Her lawyers claimed to the court that she was committed to remaining clean for her daughter. This argument and Carruthers' own confession and testimony were enough to sway officials. Judge Graham Smith noted that the woman being sentenced in 2022 and the offender from 2018 were, quote, two different people. What was supposed to be a 16-month prison sentence was changed to an 18-month suspended sentence. As part of that agreement, Carruthers was subjected to a 20-day rehab program and a four-month curfew enforced by electronic monitoring. In cases like this, it's reasonable to expect the victim to be upset. This goes double when the victim is the offender's mother, seemingly showcasing poor parenting skills for all the world to see. On the contrary, Carruthers' mom turned up in court to support her daughter. The whole thing ended with poor mom on a credit blacklist and the financing company unable to recover most of the original amount financed. Even so, her mom indicated that she loves and supports her daughter and will stick by her. Number four, ATM investment. Scammers Colin Voke and Amy Ploy Pittman out of Darwin, Australia, racked up about $1.9 million banking on ATMs that didn't exist, with their first victim being Pittman's father. Sources say she stole almost $300,000 from him, and dear old dad had no idea he was being let on. Such a substantial sum should be more than enough to get a legitimate ATM business off the ground. But that was never the plan. They simply told people they had a legit company and asked them to get on board. The pair hooked 17 people. Pittman roped in several victims from the hospital she worked at. She had no problem scamming her co-workers on company time. ATM ownership and the operation of the ATMs aren't all that complicated. There are several companies out there willing to help you start out. According to one of those companies, all you would need to start is a suitable location and about five thousand dollars to buy the machine, get it hooked up, and load it with an initial payload of cash. Pittman and her beau chose to skip this part because it was too complicated for them. You must service the ATMs, repair them, keep them loaded, and so on. These are all things that the pair didn't want to do for their investors. They did at least one semi-honest thing. They shelled out around seven hundred thousand dollars to pay their investors, but the money came from other investors' funds, aka it was a Ponzi scheme. Officials estimated a figure shy of one point nine million dollars as the ultimate take in the scam. This number included the initial $300,000 kick-in from Pittman's dad. Despite everything, he was still willing to throw down $10,000 against his daughter's bail. Even so, the courts ultimately denied bail in the case. The other victims probably didn't feel the same way, and the court suspected the victims they had proof about weren't the only ones taken in. In December of 2018, the couple pled guilty to multiple charges. This netted them each a seven and a half year sentence, four of which which were without the possibility of parole. Number three, party money. Hannah Dickinson had the grim task of telling those in her life that she was facing terminal cancer. Our story began in 2012 when Hannah went to her parents asking for cash for life-saving treatment. Not long after, she needed another procedure that would happen in New Zealand. By 2013, Dickinson had stretched her parents paper thin they began turning to friends, neighbors, associates, and anybody else who would lend a hand. Dickinson didn't go around asking on her own. Residents eventually came together to give Dickinson everything she needed. This would be a heartwarming story of a community rallying around one of their own, if it weren't a complete scam. Turns out Hannah's grim task was self-imposed and totally unnecessary. She had scammed everybody around her. There was no cancer, and none of the money that people gave to her ended up going to medical treatments. The cancer she claimed to have, it's worth noting, was a rare form that has a high survival rate and is among the easiest to cure. This meant she could claim to be healed and back out of the whole deal whenever she wanted. The whole thing is even more heinous because one of her victims was an actual cancer survivor. Fresh off his own treatment, the generous guy kicked in $10,000 out of the nearly 42000 that Dickinson made off with in the end. She got found out in 2018 after one of her victims saw a suspicious social media post and contacted the police. 
Cops put out the word, and others came forward in short order. It was later revealed that she had been using the money to party it up with friends at home and abroad. Hard partying and holidays were the name of the game, all made possible by money that was supposed to be paying for life-saving medical treatments. Naturally, her travels included some serious drinking and use of illegal substances, both of which were a constant in her brief new life. This ended up playing into her case later on. When her entire fake story shattered in 2018, Dickinson landed in court. Officials saddled her with seven charges of obtaining property by deception. Despite just how brazen her crimes were, one person saw good in her still, her lawyer, Beverly Lindsay. The defense brought up the case of a health blogger, Belle Gibson, who was ultimately saddled with a $400,000 fine for misleading her readers and scamming whatever she could get out of her audience. This was all done under the guise of putting out content to help others in similar situations, which Lindsay argued made Gibson's case worse. She pleaded with the magistrate not to send Dickinson to jail. The magistrate saw things differently. Court official David Starvaghi argued that Dickinson's in-your-face fraud to her own parents, no less, required swift and decisive deterrence. As such, he threw Dickinson in jail for three months. She also caught a 12-month community service order that amounted to 150 hours along with court-mandated rehab. This resulted in the scammer losing her job at Little Real Estate as a property manager. At the same time frame as the original scam, it turns out that Dickinson was engaging in a much more conventional fraud. Records show she attempted to get a car loan for $30,000 using fake documents and a fake identity. As if that wasn't enough, she nabbed over $100,000 in disability payments using fake documents submitted to the local magistrate's office. The whole thing came out in 2021, and Dickinson found herself in court again. Officials were much less lenient this time. They slapped her with a sentence of at least a year for using false documentation with more charges pending as of 2022. The car loan was reportedly not granted, making it a bit less serious. The disability payments, however, went on from 2014 to 2018 when her original case broke. Number two, cancer banker. Rajesh Gedia of Berkshire pocketed around 1.8 million pounds from multiple scams, including defrauding insurance and pension companies with claims of a cancer diagnosis. The scams ran from 2016 onward and included a claim that he had been promoted to vice president at his employer, Bank of America. Gedia claimed to have aggressive pancreatic cancer, giving him a year to live. The scam perpetrated on his pension and life insurance companies allowed him to withdraw funds he otherwise would have had to wait quite some time for all at once. About 1.2 a million pounds of his total take came from this avenue. Along the way, Gedia had an unnamed accomplice pose as a doctor to vouch for him, and he dragged many unknowing doctors' names into the case. The other half of the story is that he claimed to be the vice president of Bank of America. He used this position to convince victims to invest in banking products and services that did not exist. Two of those victims were his cousin and his own father. Things initially came to a head with a documentation issue found in 2019. Still, he continued scamming with a new insurance company buying and cash a policy worth 900,000 pounds. According to officials, Gedia spent the cash on a mansion in the expensive Virginia water area of Surrey. He also got his hands on some expensive vehicle. To put the cherry on top, he sent his children to an expensive private school in the area. Whether his primary motivation was selfish greed or providing a better life for his children, he still sentenced seven souls to financial ruin. Falsely representing both Bank of America and Goldman Sachs, Gedia scammed 600,000 pounds from seven different victims. His cousin, Vipul Chandegra, was out 63,000 pounds. Some 100 116,000 pounds left the pockets of Per Selbeck, a local dad whose kids went to the same school as Gedius. At a party, he met Wayne Johncock, who lost out on 181,000 pounds. Perhaps the most tragic victims were Gedius regular taxi driver and the man's wife, Saida Ahmed. The pair lost over 100,000 pounds to the scam. Part of it was taxes attached to the investment, which the couple borrowed around 70,000 pounds to pay. This resulted in them losing their home. What makes this part of the story sting even worse is that he faked the death of his own daughter to get out of owning up. When Saida confronted him the first time, he concocted a car accident in the state that had his daughter hospitalized, drawing his attention from the matter at hand. When she confronted him again, he shrugged her off by saying his daughter had succumbed to her injuries. When the law finally caught up with Gedia in 2022, he was saddled with 30 fraud charges. The court showed him no mercy, and he ultimately pled guilty to 22 of those charges. Judge Deborah Taylor sympathized with the victims and painted a picture of Gedia as a man with no morals. Detective Constable 
Daniel Weller of London's Insurance Fraud Enforcement. Judge Taylor sentenced Gidea to a grand total of six years and nine months in prison. Authorities went to work getting victims their money back, liquidating Gidea's ill-gotten asset. Number one, Ponzi Pharmacist. Natalie Cochran, 40, a pharmacist from Raleigh County, West Virginia, ran a scam that ultimately cost her victims a hefty $2 million. She used two companies that she owned with her husband to run an elaborate Ponzi scheme 2017 to 2019, defrauding individuals, companies, and even banks along the way. The scam centered around investments in her two companies, Technology Management Solutions and Tactical Solutions Group. The two fake companies were misrepresented to 11 people, among other victims. The investors were convinced by fake government contracts and other files produced by Cochrane. She sold them on the experience, contracts, and projects her company never had. To keep the scam going, Cochrane used some of the money to pay back old investors as new ones jumped on board. The classic Ponzi scheme was peppered by personal and business expenditures, some over $10,000 each. None of them pertained to any of the contracts or investments that Cochrane represented. However, she used $35,000 of the money to buy a sweet 1965 Shelby Cobra, a collector's item that could be argued as an investment. The United States isn't the best place to run a Ponzi scheme, as Cochrane found out in 2020. The investigation involved multiple agencies and local and federal government branches, including the Secret Service. High-stakes crimes were finally brought to light in September 2020, when Cochrane pled guilty to charges involving money laundering and wire fraud. Her sentence was 11 years in prison and three years of supervised release. Along with jail time, Cochrane has to pay back over $2.5 million to her victim. So far, Asset forfeitures have barely scratched the surface. The seizure of her personal and company bank accounts only yielded $45,000. Most scam stories end when the perpetrator gets their day in court. In this case, however, things only get weirder and darker. Cochran was suspected of going after her own husband. Michael Cochran fell ill while all this was happening and reportedly died in hospice care in February. The late Michael was only 38, making natural causes a suspicious conclusion. Local investigators were struck by this fact and decided to look deeper into it. After all, if Natalie killed her co-owner husband, she would no longer have to split the loot. Additionally, that would be one less loose end. Michael's body was exhumed and an autopsy was performed. The investigation is ongoing as of 2022, leaving authorities tight-lipped on the matter. What's known is that Natalie was brought back into court in 2022, indicted for her husband's passing, and faced first-degree charges. With a not guilty plea and the trial date still pending, this is anybody's guess as to what will happen before it's all over. Click to watch one of these next videos, and let us know in the comments section who's worse, any scammer on this list or any famous prosperity preacher.